Okay, so uh, let me get started. Uh, everybody, uh, welcome to the session. The session topic is uh, A-B testing theory, practice and pitfalls. A uh, little bit about me. <clears throat> so my name is Shri Mukundan. I work as a data scientist in Verizon a and I have uh, 12 plus years of experience uh, and eight years in big data analytics. Uh, my interest in is in experimentation and causal inference, recommender systems and reinforcement learning. Okay, so let me go into full screen. So uh, I hope, uh, yeah, I'm audible, right? Okay, cool. So let me go into full screen. So the agenda of uh, today's uh, talk is that uh, we'll start with some background to design of experiments. Uh, then we will uh, design, we will uh, discuss uh, the steps to, what are the steps to uh, do an A-B test uh, design. Uh, we'll look, uh, look at a small example um, uh, and follow the steps of uh, this uh, design process. Uh, and finally, uh, we'll do the, uh, we'll look at the A-B testing pitfalls. So there are basically three sections. Uh, first, we will uh, talk about the experimentation design, experimental design, uh, which is sort of giving some kind of background as to the uh, area of experimental design and how A-B testing fits into the whole thing. Second part is on the uh, design process for A-B test. And the third is the A-B testing pitfalls. Okay, so, <clears throat> so uh, this, I will start with the design of experiments. So before we uh, delve more into it, I just wanted to like uh, put up the first slide for motivation. Why do we need to like um, study uh, experimental design? So so uh, basically like uh, we, we see that the, a B test is basically a randomized control trial, which is one of the experimental design, and it has been there for like quite uh, quite some time. It has been used in uh, say medical research, uh, drug trials, uh, and lately, like tech companies have started using the uh, the A B testing uh, process for marketing campaigns, conversion optimization, etc. So. Uh, actually like the amount of experiments that they are doing is like uh, keeping on increasing uh, so there is this rule like uh, companies like amazon netflix uh, they do 10000 experiments per year and uh, out of those experiments uh, there is like uh, 9 out of 10 experiments fail so there are some numbers quoted as to like 9 out of 10 fail uh, at least 50 percentage of them definitely fail but they still uh, go ahead and do those experiments because the payoff for uh, say so the experiments that actually get uh, succeeded, right? It can be like quite high. Uh, some of some of the experiments can uh, can give a, a lot of lot of payoff. So as an example, uh, let's look at this say the Bing uh, Microsoft Bing experiment. Uh, it's a UI experiment where you have uh, you have two. Uh, two kinds of ways the display of the search results is shown. In the first where uh, like uh, there is this short uh, headline and the second one is the long headline. Uh, for some reason, the long headline was actually like resulting in more uh, ad clicks. So uh, this this is the this is something that nobody could have guessed. But um, uh, this is something that you can only find out by say experiment. Which which one will work? Which one doesn't work? Uh, this is not some possible for us to like uh, uh, know beforehand. So this UI experiment actually like uh, earned uh, Microsoft some uh, twelve percentage in revenue, and it converted to some hundred million dollars per year. So that's the reason why uh, the comp tech companies like when they see this kind of payoffs, right? Say they they try to do more experiments. This there is actually this quote from say Amazon SEC filing which says that. If you have a say a ten percent chance of a hundred times payoff, you should take that bet every time. So that is the uh, that is why the uh, uh, like companies are trying to do more experiments so that uh, they can see these payoffs. And uh, one of the uh, maturity level say for AIML maturity level for companies like say you can say that's is there is this ten thousand uh, rule ten thousand experiment rule. So if a company has got uh, say ten to if is if a company is doing ten thousand experiments per year then you can assume that it has gotten good experimentation culture. And that is something that all companies are actually like aspire for. So that's for motivation. So there are a lot of payoffs and uh, uh, companies are becoming more experiment driven uh, in addition to being data driven. Okay, so, 
so we saw that the experiments are basically the uh, it, it is it is done for research right medical research so uh, if you look at say uh, typically how a research a researcher or scientist goes about like finding an answer to a research question right so you, you uh, in to start with you will come up with a plan uh, so it's called as a research study design whether you want to do a say a qualitative study or a quantitative study Say for example, you you ha you have like a, a hypothesis that uh, McDonald's people who are McDonald's customers are not health conscious, right? So uh, for that you can have do a qualitative study. You can go to McDonald's uh, and then ask people, uh, give them a survey questions, and then like it is like an interview or a focus group study, and then do a qualitative study about uh, trying to understand how health conscious they are. Uh, and on other in other scenarios you might have to do a quantitative study where you have to like uh, do some kind of analysis with numbers for example if you are if you have a, like a question a research question as to like a, a social media brand uh, or so more social media likes on a page convert to more sales right if you have something like um, if you have a hypothesis like that and you want to do a study you can do a correlational study you can pick up uh, brands and look at their pages likes and then how much sales they are doing you can do a correlational study but as you know correlation uh, not is not always like uh, convert to causation right so uh, some for some studies this might work but so for some you might be getting misleading answers so in that case you will you want to have more rigor when you do a, a research study so that's when you go for experimental quantitative studies so in the in an experimental study what you do is that you uh, you look at the say your variable of interest you look at the vari variables of your interest and you alter or manipulate uh, one of the variable and then you kind of do your uh, study of the phenomenon so that is what a researcher does or a scientist does say for example if you say that um, uh, if, if you with uh, temperature with increasing temperature molecules move faster supposing that is a science um, like a hypothesis so what you can do is that you can take up take up say a vessel uh, with the uh, water and then uh, your variable of interest is temperature so you keep on increasing the temperature you manipulate the temperature and look at and you kind of study the phenomenon so here your variable of interest is um, uh, temperature and you vary it and then you do the study and then you try to come up with answers which are uh, which are more rigorous than the other studies right so you can see that uh, the, uh, there are like the several different research methodologies that you can adopt uh, be before like uh, coming to a conclusion as to like uh, for a causal um, for, for doing a causal like say uh, this is the cause for that if you want to come up with a, a statement like that there are different uh, uh, different methodologies and uh, there is this evidence pyramid that uh, that is like uh, uh, that that people say which says that uh, say that among these methodologies there are like some methodologies or have more reliability compared to other methods so uh, at the bottom of the pyramid you have uh, expert opinion and you can see that the randomized control trials are at the top of the pyramid uh, which have like more reliability, um, uh, more reliability. So randomized control trials, or uh, which is actually A/B testing, is actually the gold standard for uh, the causal inference. Doing causal inference, we will see why that is the case. Okay. Okay. So before we uh, kind of like go into that, we have we want to like uh, figure out. I mean, we want to uh, like have some kind of terminology. Um, so what is an experiment? Basically, you are trying to uh, examine a truth of hypothesis or uh, relating to a research question, right? So uh, let's take th this field of experimental design actually came uh, like uh, uh, in 1920s. It was pioneered by Fisher. So he studied agricultural yield uh, uh, of uh, like farmland, okay? And um, say he had, uh, there was a, something like, uh, if you have like a hypothesis, like say increase in agricultural yield is caused by using certain kind of say nitrogen fertilizer, okay? So that is your, that is your um, say the hypothesis that you want to verify. Okay, and uh, uh, for this, you will you will have to like say that can there can be like a um, like there can be two states, an initial state and a final state, and uh, the final state is where you have a, uh, you have the increased agricultural yield, 
and the initial state was normal yield and it is your statement is that it is caused by the use of nitrogen fertilizer so usage of nitrogen fertilizer is what you are saying that uh, it is a factor in actually determining the agricultural yield okay but uh, the when you when you kind of try to construct an experiment for this uh, it can uh, we, we have to be careful in uh, constructing experiment because the agricultural yield can depend on so many other things as well. Suppose that there was good rain or uh, where you conducted the experiment, the soil fertility was uh, high. So uh, there are some external factors which can also increase the agricultural yield, right? So uh, when you want to uh, do an experiment, you want to like uh, reduce this kind of say, uh, errors in your experiment. So the idea of uh, experimental design is that if uh, if you have a careful design, you can reduce the error of the experiment and a good experimental design will actually like increase the reliability of the experiment. So that is that is the uh, foundational uh, thing for uh, say experimental design and we there are like so many different experimental designs that are possible. Okay, so uh, in this case, like uh, you, you will call these variables that are actually influencing your, uh, uh, say the independent variable, just the agricultural yield, they are called as covariates. Uh, there are internal factors uh, and there are extra external factors. So the external factors are called as confounding variables. These are some terminology. Um, so confounding variables and extraneous variables. So uh, when you want to construct an experiment, you want to be able to uh, achieve high um, internal validity. Internal validity meaning that you want to be able to strictly con uh, control the influence of the con confounding variables and avoid uh, selection by, uh, bias. So that is internal validity. And also you want to have an external validity, which is to say that um, you, you want to be able to, uh, whatever inference that you arrive uh, from this experiment, you, you want it to be generalized, uh, you want to be applica applied generally so it should be applicable for like say the whole population or at a different time period so that is called external validity so when you want to construct an experiment you want to construct an experiment in such a way that it increases the internal validity and the external validity by uh, by taking into account the confound the effect of the confounding variables okay so that is the so that's some terminology so so uh, coming to this agricultural uh, land uh, and uh, the design, uh, so the experimental design. So there are like uh, three principles in experimental design, which is to, first principle is called as uh, replication. So uh, there you, you, the application of this nitrogen fertilizer, right? So that is called as a treatment. Uh, so when you want to like uh, construct an experiment, you can like divide your farm farmland into say multiple tracks. And you can you apply to one of the tracks and then see whether the agricultural yield is increasing. So that is one way. And uh, if suppose you, uh, you 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 replicate this, right? So you kind of like apply it to say one one particular track, and then again like uh, say you also could also observe the same phenomenon in other tracks. Then uh, then your uh, experimental there's the, your experiment has becoming more reliable. So that is first principle is you replicate you, your experimental result should be like uh, observed in a rep, uh, when it's replicated it should be observed uh, similar kind of observation should come so the second principle is randomization so uh, we saw that uh, there are go there are going to be like uh, external variables that are also going to uh, influence right so but what we are interested in is whether the application of fertilizer is going to increase uh, you but uh, it might happen that uh, the soil uh, the where it is actually like um, the uh, the soil also the soil fertility also is an external factor and that also has an effect right so how do we actually minimize this effect uh, so what they do is that they they create like multiple uh, plots uh, multiple uh, like farm plots right and then uh, and then they on on these multiple farm plots they randomly pick up a few plots for uh, application of this nitrogen fertilizer and few plots for uh, uh, few plots they don't apply the nitrogen fertilizer so in this case what happens is that uh, the external factor that is the soil fertility that uh, that that the effect of that is actually like randomly distributed uh, across it's independently distributed the errors are independently distributed so whichever effect it might have happened which might have had that effect would have been minimized so this is the principle of randomization 
okay and the third factor third principle is uh, principle of local control or blocking so here what you do is that supposing that you uh, you have uh, an external you, re, you you have an external factor that you know that it's going to influence so you put it you kind of like isolate it in a separate group for example if you say that um, a particular drug um, a drug trial uh, it gender is a variable that uh, that uh, for some genders it my uh, i mean uh, for male or female and if for male it can work and male female it cannot work if you have some kind of hypothesis like that what you do is that you kind of like create two blocks one block is completely male and another block is completely female so any in any effect of the gender uh, will actually get contained in that particular block and you can do the study so this is the principle of local control so with these three principles now you can like come up uh, apply these principles and you can come up with uh, several possible experimental designs so i'll just uh, it's uh, like uh, i'll just give a like a brief uh, about some of these designs and then we will see that uh, why uh, randomized control is like one of the experimental design okay so first is uh, first one is that uh, you have a very simple one where you apply a treat, uh, you have a before and after. So you apply uh, a treatment be before applying the treatment, you do a study and then you observe uh, the effect. And then after applying the treatment, then you observe, observe the effect. And then this be before and after, there is nothing like a separate control group that is there. Um, this is one simpler, de simple design. The, this, this is also like this kind of design is also like used in some scenarios to study, uh, to, to some quasi experimental studies so follow this kind of design. So you can also have a design with um, having an explicit control and uh, the control will, so the, for the control, uh, and the test, uh, you, you will not have that, uh, treatment applied to the control. So there can be a, you observe before and after like say before uh, the treatment uh, uh, test and control what is the uh, effect and after the treatment uh, ap applied to only the test what is the effect so this kind of study design is also possible uh, this is this is before and after with a explicit control group where you have introduced a control group uh, to isolate uh, say the, so between between the control and test the only difference is that uh, the treatment is apl applied. The, tre the effect of the treatment variable is an additional, only additional delta in the test group. So, uh, so that is, so it, that way you, you can say that, okay, whatever you are observing uh, should be the effect of the additional uh, treatment variable. So uh, that is the, uh, that is the reason why you will have control. Uh, other, other reason, other possible say designs, so you, the, some more complicated designs, um, we we don't have to go deep into that. So, but but you can like have two different kind of uh, population and then like select uh, randomly select people from that and then you form your groups and again like randomly assign them to groups and then divide them into two uh, categories and then apply uh, treatment A to one one category and of people and treatment B to one category of people. This is like replicated design. So this is another way, and you can also do blocking in the uh, block in the blocking design. Here you want to like say uh, see multiple uh, treatments, say multiple question forms. You want to see how students are performing, and you kind of like create a block design where uh, all the low IQ uh, like peer will be in one block, and you kind of like split them to uh, into different blocks based on their IQ, and you can construct design like that. So. The, uh, like um, there are these different uh, designs and every e so from simplicity to complicated and um, each of them have their own advantages and disadvantages but what we want to study is the randomized controlled design which is uh, the a b testing what uh, normally uh, people follow here um, what what they, what is done is that you have a population from there you randomly select people uh, select uh, do some selection and then you form your sample and from that sample, you uh, you form two groups, treatment and control, and the treatment uh, is applied one to only to this treatment group, and control group is like kept as such. So this is the randomized control design. So you can see like uh, from what we discussed, the control group uh, why it is actually necessary because it is minimizing the effect of uh, all other variables except the imp impact of the variable in the treatment. So that is why we uh, the control uh, we have, and also you can see why randomization is uh, important. So, 
uh, we, we have like uh, say uh, although we have these several designs we always go for the ab testing uh, uh, because of its simplicity and uh, it is uh, possible with the simple design itself we, it is possible for us to like achieve high internal validity uh, internal validity meaning that any uh, the any other effect of other extra extraneous variables or covariates so those effect can be like balanced so with the, it is possible to it is not 100% but it is possible to achieve high internal validity and also um, uh, in some cases you also ex extend this particular design with blocking for example you you can construct the say two groups uh, where in one group you will have device type with apple and another group with uh, device type uh, device type with uh, say samsung or android so that's kind of the so it is it's basically uh, extending with a blocking so those kinds of uh, designs are possible but uh, most of one we will go with uh, uh, simple ab testing because of, because mainly for the simplicity um, one of the things that to know about the uh, say randomized control design is that it's uh, it's essentially based on this uh, stable unit treatment value assumptions. Is it, it basically says that between the treatment and control uh, units there is not much uh, inter interference. So uh, sometimes uh, when you have to when you are designing it you have to see you have to uh, like uh, remember with, remember about this uh, if there is going to be some kind of interference between treatment and control. Okay. So that is about the experimental design and uh, some of some background. So uh, in the next part, we will go ahead and uh, see how to actually like design an A-B test. What are the steps involved in uh, doing the A-B test? Okay. Okay. So uh, when you are going to design an A-B test, uh, there there are there are like uh, uh, there are some steps that you follow. Uh, you know what now? What is the A-B test? And uh, we know why we need randomization. Uh, why why we need a control group uh, right now? Uh, and uh, but we when we are doing the design, we have to like uh, go through uh, like um, some kind of steps uh, to do this very carefully because there is a lot of um, uh, what to say that that's a lot that, that can you can get get it wrong in like uh, several places so we have to do this in a little bit more carefully so uh some design questions i have uh, listed here but oh the overall what you will do is i have uh, like the five steps uh that i have listed out uh in the books that i read there are this majorly five steps first is that you have you choose your uh, metric of interest uh like where you want to like say uh, uh like say uh, see the effect or the change for example conversion rate or retention right so those are your metric of interest and you define an overall evaluation criterion so that's step one then step two is randomization to how how you will do randomization then you set up your hypothesis test then you step four is uh, to calculate the sample size and test duration from power analysis and step five is to run the test and anal analyze the results um, and then make a decision. So that those are the five steps. Uh, in addition to that, when you are do, doing the design, uh, you have to also consider other things like say the ethical uh, ethicality of the experiment, how safe is it? Um, so uh, so the, some of the other things that also you have to uh, take care of it. Uh, so we can come, uh, come to this uh, like uh, when we discuss the pitfalls. So uh, the first step of it is uh, coming up with the overall evaluation criterion. So the Microsoft papers, they use this terminology called as overall evaluation criterion. So basically you want to define what is your success metric. So when you say a metric, it can be like, uh, uh, there are like different kinds of metrics that are possible. Uh, you can have engagement metrics and uh, uh, th there are several different kinds of metrics that are possible. and the metrics themselves are uh, actually like uh, they are, they are they are in a hierarchy so you will have a north star uh, metric that is like strategic to the whole company and you will have some metrics that are like um, specific to your product product kpi metrics uh, you will have the day to day operational metrics or so, uh, some other uh, secondary metrics so those kinds of metrics you will have so uh, when you want to basically construct an ab test uh, you want to make sure that whichever uh, like um, your uh, what metric you want to like uh, define for success and also uh, the good practice is that you also have to come up with an invariant metric invariant metric meaning that because of the introduction of the uh, this uh, say the ab testing 
so some metrics should not like change okay so that is like a uh, that's like a having a, a safeguard uh, like some metrics should not change so that's a good design to have some invariant metrics so uh, the overall evaluation criterion is because uh, that because we have this multiple metrics right so most often like you might want to like uh, construct a composite metric and then you can call it like okay the on this composite metric you want to see any change or improvement so that's what you call it as a overall evaluation criterion okay so the next step is to choose once you have decided the metric then you have to uh, choose the randomization unit actually the how you randomize is also import is also dependent on how you have chosen your metrics so you can either do a randomization based on uh, say uh, a few sessions you you want to assign to treatment few sessions you want to assign to control or few user accounts you want to uh, uh, have it in treatment few user accounts in control so which which is the randomization unit that you have to pick uh, like it's, it's actually a, a judgment call and uh, the the best practice is that the whatever the randomization unit that we are picking uh, it should be in the same uh, like granularity as the metrics that we are analyzing for example if you want to like uh, see a change in say revenue per user it is better to have a user level randomization so uh, so that so basically how you, you randomize right so that is also important in some cases people don't even randomize so i have seen experiments like ab testing experiments where just say that in the us the east coast they will have one as treatment west coast some as control so that's that is not actually a good practice um, so it is best to like do some kind of randomization by picking on uh, like say oh, some randomization unit and the third step is to set up the hypothesis. Now you you have the uh, say the success metric, and you you also have know how to do the how to create the treatment and control. Then you will set up your null uh, null and alternate hypothesis. So uh, you can as as you know the statistical inference, you can only like um, uh, reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject. So you will have a like opposite whatever you want to achieve. You will set up a like an opposite statement as null hypothesis, saying that change has no effect, and alternate hypothesis change has an effect. Uh, and uh, like uh, and then you will pick up a statistical test. So uh, normally, like people go for this. Um, uh, uh, I mean, normal normal distribution because they assume that the uh, the metric of whatever metric it follows a normal distribution. So, uh, but it it essentially depends on uh, like say three things. Uh, the what is the probability density function of the metric of choice? What is the underlying probability distribution? Uh, what is the sample size? And what is the nature of the hypothesis? Based on that, you will uh, like pick uh, uh, the statistical test. So I have given some links here. I will share this PPT uh, in the end. So the so you can like see some of these links like uh, based on these criteria and you you will pick like one of these uh, one of these statistical tests and also you will also have to uh, like pick on the uh, decide on the parameters which are like well, say what is the statistical significance level that you want to achieve um, what is the minimum detectable effect uh, for example you want the lift uh, you want a conversion rate lift to be like at least two two percent three percent like that. So the, so those parameters also you will decide uh, in the step three. So once you have done uh, both of these steps, then you will have to like uh, decide on uh, say how how much uh, how your test is powered. I mean uh, basically like um, the, so basically like there is this formula. I I am giving you a very high level here. Um, so there is this uh, formula that it connects uh, these four quantities, the power, uh, effect size, significance level, and sample size. So if you have any any three of these quantities, then you can find the fourth quantity. Uh, here, you, you already set the significance level to be like, uh, say, normally like they say 0 0.05, the 95 percentage, um, I mean, uh, the, the uh, significance level in this will be like 0 0.05. And then you have you have uh, the effect size. Effect size is like um, uh, how like what is the difference that you want to observe between say treatment and control. Say uh, like what is the effect basically. Um, so based on that, you will have you come up with uh, say something called as an effect size. Uh, 
and you will have a power i mean statistical power so statistical power is uh, is is, uh, is actually uh, like a um, is a metric which, which say which is inversely related to type 2 error so if you if you have if you are making uh, say um, uh, say a uh, statistical inference because we are now like working on a small sample that is assigned to treatment and control but we are going to uh, make uh, some kind of inference on the whole population right so that is why the statistical inference concepts are coming and uh, now uh, when you when you want to like uh, do do a inference either you can make a type 1 error or type 2 error so type 1 error is that you you conclude there is a significant difference between treatment and control when there is no difference and type 2 error is you conclude there is no significant difference when actually there is a significant difference and uh, the statistical power is basically uh, uh, basically when you have higher static statistical power you will have a you will have lower type two low low type two error so uh, so how much uh, type two error you are willing to tolerate so that determines your statistical power of the test normally like you can set like 80 percent or something like that and then uh, with these three quantities then you can say you can come up with what is the sample size that you have to you will require so from sample size you can also come up with uh, say test duration because like say uh, if you want to say that uh, you need at least like say 1000 samples then you can look at say normally for your website how many visits are there per day and then like divide divide the sample size by the number of visits and say that at least you should run this test for this many um, this many days so you can come up with the test duration so uh, this is the step 4 where you have uh, you come up with uh, say uh, sample size and test duration and uh, after that you will go ahead and run the test um, and then uh, finally when uh, that uh, results are coming you will make a whether uh, whether to like make a launch or not la or no go decision so that actually depends on whether you have achieving your uh, statistical significance and practical significance so uh, there is this uh, diagram here which is um, which actually gives like a decision steps as to like whether to launch or not uh, not a launch but uh, but we, the ba ba basic thing is that you should be able to like, um, uh, if you have a good statistical significance and practical significance, uh, practical significance is that whether you, whatever the detectable effect that you want minimally that you are able to see. So if you are able to get that uh, both, then you can go ahead with the launch. So you'll just see an example of this uh, to go through uh, these steps. Uh, okay. Okay, so um, I'm so I'm I'm going to like uh, walk through a simple example uh, here. Uh, like uh, this, this is basically based on this um, uh, data set that uh, I have here. Uh, the, you can download this from Kaggle, and I also have uh, like a solution that uh, that is available here. The links are here. So uh, the problem is that you have a like assume that you have a medi medium sized online e-commerce e business and then um, th there is a, a new version of the landing page is available uh, and you which pro which which is which is says that okay if you use the new version you will have um, better conversion rate okay the current conversion rate is about 13% and they say that you want to achieve at least like 15% i mean the the minimum effect that you want to achieve uh, is two percentages targeted so that is the uh, that's the statement that we have so uh, for this you want to like uh, run an a b test so we will walk through the these five steps that we actually discussed now and then look at uh, look at it briefly so to start off with uh, yeah so you will first start with uh, come, uh, what are the success metric that you are targeting so here it's uh, obvious which is the conversion rate uh, and uh, what is the minimum detectable effect is that you want at least two percentage uh, lift in the conversion rate okay and uh, next step is that you will want to um, do a randomization uh, to create treatment and control here you are using the user id to create the uh, randomization uh, and based on the user id you assign some user to uh, say control and some user to uh, treatment uh, then uh, like there are some 290,000 records here. So then you will set up your hypothesis test. So here, uh, you, here you will set up say the first, uh, the null hypothesis will be that uh, between the new and old design, there is not much change. Uh, so that is a, I mean, there is no change. There is no change. There is a null hypothesis. 
uh, and then you will also set up your confidence level to 91st, 95% and uh, significance level to 0 0.05. Now, uh, with these in place, then uh, you will go to the step four where you are calculating the sample size. Uh, with the power of, uh, with the power, you will have the first, you will have the effect size uh, based on the say between 30, 13 percentage to 15 percentage you want to achieve based on that you calculate the effect size. Then uh, you assuming the normal distribution, then you there is this uh, uh, function called as a solve power where you can give the, uh, say the power as 80 percentage of size on alpha and it will give the sample size that is required. Uh, and uh, we need at least 4,720 observations in each group. Um, okay, so uh, there are some data cleaning steps that are done. So then, then the next step is you do the sampling for the, the required uh, for both control and treatment. So for both control and treatment, you have done a sample with uh, 4,720 and then uh, and then uh, you conduct the experiment, uh, right? And uh, so let's say that after you have conducted the experiment, you can you got this converted or not, uh, this additional co column you have gotten it, okay? And then and then you uh, and then you between the uh, controller treatment, you see like how much of how much is the conversion rate, okay? So that is that's what you uh, look at it in the this in this four thousand seven thirty samples between treatment and control. Here we see that it is almost like uh, similar. Um, then, uh, but we, we will go ahead and uh, calculate the confidence interval and p-value. So, uh, so you, when you calculate the p-value, we will see that it is uh, a 0 0.732, which is like uh, much higher than 0 0.05. And also you are arriving at the confidence interval for treatment group uh, to be like uh, 0.1, uh, that's 11.62, 13.5. So you wanted like 15 percentage um, for minimum effect, but you are uh, you are the range that you the, you are actually able to get is only like 11.6 to 13.5. So there is no practical significance that you are able to achieve. Also, the statistical significance also you are not able to achieve uh, because you, it is like p value. Uh, I mean, uh, the 0.732 is like very high. So you fail to reject the null hypothesis which means that our new design did not perform significantly different uh, between the uh, significant. And so we don't have to go ahead with the launch of this uh, new UI page. Okay, so that are the five steps. And uh, this is a simple example of how to actually like uh, uh, go ahead and do the A-B test. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we have 20 more minutes. Okay, so we'll have, uh, we'll finally like uh, look at the final section, which is the A-B testing pitfalls. So uh, we saw the, uh, now how to like, uh, what, where A-B testing fits in in the experimental design and how to actually like go ahead and uh, set up an A-B test. But uh, you, you, there are limitations to A-B testing. Uh, so it is, it, it, in some, some scenarios, it is not possible for us to conduct A-B test at all. If, for example, it is not where you are, there are scenarios where it is not possible to randomize or you can't have a, like a separate control, for example, uh, if you want to conduct an experiment, say, to test whether uh, one level of pricing, uh, two levels of pricing, right, two price uh, of, for your product. And uh, it is actually like uh, unethical. In the same market, if you just give two prices to two people, it is actually like unethical and it is not possible to like uh, do, uh, like for some cases, it's not possible to actually like do randomization or have control. Uh, so those scenarios you can't you won't be able to conduct a b test uh, because of the inability to randomize or having control other cases where uh, like when you calculate the sample size you you, uh, you are you won't be able to like have that uh, that that much amount of sample size so there also you won't be able to conduct a b test or the regular a b test you won't be able to do you you might have to like use other techniques or enhanced techniques of a b test uh, and also if if you have a very long duration uh, right so uh, there are also like we, we if for some scenarios you you can't afford to have this long duration test for example say uh, news headlines so news headlines is for just for one day and they conduct this uh, kind of like say which one is like people are clicking in a new site they have they might run two headlines like which people are clicking uh, but they want to finish off everything within the same day and they can't like afford to like run it for say several months right so though, though there also you you can't use a b testing and you need other techniques to use it so those are there are some limitations to a b testing uh, when you do actually a b testing 
uh, like there are uh, scenarios where you uh, go run into some kind of issue uh, because of uh, some errors and pitfalls you you have you can you can like uh, go into so uh, i have like uh, there, there are like actually like so many things uh, so many such pitfalls that are like listed out in several places uh, i have one list here um so the ma the major majority of those pitfalls are basically coming from the say the misinterpretation or misapplication of uh, statistics um so and also uh, some some other issues like say novelty and primacy so there are there are a few uh, pitfalls that are there so uh, i have taken like only like five examples for the because we don't have much time so uh, we, we can just see like five examples like how uh, ab testing uh, like uh, like it's misapplied and then you get uh, results that are actually like uh, with error okay so pitfall one that we will see is early stopping or peaking so this is um, this the early stopping or peaking is uh, like once you have decided uh, say what is your uh, sample size and test duration with the power analysis you should actually like run that test for uh, that amount of time so you have to, you actually have to commit to that uh, particular experiment duration and then after the that is completed stop the experiment and then do the analysis but what happens uh, is that people will continuously monitor the p value so they won't be able to wait till the experiment duration is completed, but p-value will be keeping on fluctuating. But there might be some scenarios where the, your p-value can go down a point zero five, and uh, there are uh, and then you you just when you stop the experiment and then declare success that okay p-value has now like reached below point zero five, so it's a success. Then that's a problem because like uh, it it can fluctuate through the uh, course of the experiment. So the early stopping if you do and then declare success, that's actually like a misapplication um, uh, of the say the concepts. And also, like uh, the other way is also possible, where you have actually run your test till the duration, but you saw that the p-value is like very close to like 0 0.05 or something, but a little bit higher. So what you do is that you just let it run for some more uh, days or some more duration, and you keep running that uh, like uh, in a loop. If you just keep doing that, that my it will it will always be the case that at some point you will have a p-value less than 0 0.05 so uh so that that also it's a problem because you will be like um, coming coming to wrong conclusions because you are uh, misapplying the concept so this is early stopping or peaking which is uh, which is uh, what we we should uh, we shouldn't do because uh, the solution is to basically commit to the experiment parameters that we calculated for in our during our power analysis so the second uh, pitfall that uh, is there is that uh, interference or spillover effect uh, so uh, we discussed that uh, in uh, in the initially that there is the stable unit treatment value assumption where we say that uh, the treatment and uh, uh, treatment units and control units they don't interfere with each other. But uh, in there are you know, there are use cases like in social media uh, where there is an interference between say treatment and control. Uh, one example is that uh, you ha let's say that LinkedIn introduced uh, a new a new type of say uh, feature in the chat window, and they want to measure the chat engagement or the time spent on chatting. So now, if you want to to like uh, measure this chat engagement, uh, you will have some users assigned to treatment and some users assigned to control. But what what if uh, somebody in the treatment uh, group is talking to somebody in the control group? So there, that is where the interference is coming because when he is chatting, so then both of the uh, time spent on the chat window is actually like uh, increasing. So you you will have like a, a error, error, erroneous conclusions for when you have this kind of interference between treatment and control. Uh, so the solution here is to uh, actually like go for um, Different kinds, of, different type of uh, say uh, clustered randomization or graph cluster group randomization. So there are some solutions here if you have if you actually like uh, run into these kinds of problems. Uh, like uh, it it can also happen in non social media also. For, like say when you have like a two sided marketplace, like say Uber, uh, like say where there are drivers at one end and then there are uh, um, the there are people who are hiring them. So the, in this kind of, like Airbnb. There also like uh, there some kind of interference will happen. So there also you have to like carefully think about like this this interference effects so that we don't make any uh, like uh, wrong conclusions. 
The third pitfall that uh, we will see is the sample ratio mismatch. Uh, so sample ratio mismatch is that uh, you 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 wanted to like you decided that you will have treatment uh, this much uh, uh, this much and uh, control this much uh, but uh, because of some uh, this, but this traffic allocation may not be happen in like uh, in practice uh, uh, so this can happen due to like this is called a, this is a uh, this is an error uh, this error is called a sample ratio mismatch. And this can happen due to any number of reasons. Uh, like say, if you used uh, like a poor randomization uh, hash function, uh, which is not actually like uh, uniformly splitting between say uh, E and B, or if you have a buggy implementation, engineering implementation, or uh, there can be any uh, any number of reasons where uh, you can have this kind of error. And uh, the solution uh, is to actually like uh, run some tests, like chi square test, to make sure that you actually uh, having the same ratio or uh, like not the same ratio, but the ratio that you agree you decided on that ratio you are getting. So to unmonitor it uh, during the course of the experiment. So that that is the third pitfall. The fourth pitfall uh, that we will see is uh, the Simpson's paradox. Um, so here. Um, so the Simpson paradox is like uh, you, you 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 find some kind of observation in the aggregate, okay? So uh, it's a so it's a statistical it's a statistical phenomenon that a trend appears in say the combined or aggregate data, but when you break it down to say subpopulations, you will have a reverse uh, like a, a, you will have the reverse result, okay? So that is uh, that that is called a Simpson's paradox. So in this example here, uh, like uh, if you see, you you had this uh, say twenty five thousand visits here, and then uh, page A conversion, page B conversion. You you saw it, so you saw that in the aggregate, page A is actually like doing better. But if you break this twenty five thousand and five ten thousand into say two subgroups, uh, there if you see the values right, you will see that uh, uh, page A. Uh, compared to compared to page A, page B is actually like doing well. So uh, this is called a Simpson's paradox. It's uh, it happens uh, because of uh, say the ratio and the weightages, and it's basically a statistical artifact and that we should be aware of. Um, so the solution here is to actually like um, uh, like also uh, look at the subgroups. Uh, to make uh, so that we we are not making any uh, like wrong conclusions. So uh, that's the fourth pitfall. Uh, the fifth pitfall that uh, that uh, I have here is that uh, say the current whatever that uh, current base that uh, you have uh, that you are targeting right so that might not be the actual um, ones that you you will eventually have so uh, the example here is that you have a music sales product uh, uh, music sales product and you wanted to like run uh, an A/B test like how you will display the say the song tracks. Whether you want to display the song track as artist title BPM or BPM artist title, so how uh, which one you should uh, display? So there is an you can you, there is an A/B test that was done, but uh, uh, this product was like uh, the initial uh, stages. In the initial stages, what happens is that the adoption of the people uh, for this product was actually uh, the young population. And but the product is as such was targeted for say the whole uh, whole uh, like regardless of the age group. But in the initially like because uh, young people are more tech savvy, uh, this product was adopted for uh, by the young population more. And when they looked at the say the A/B test, uh, they saw that uh, say the BPM artist title actually is doing well. Uh, it's basically the B BPM is beats per minute. So. Uh, but uh, the reason why this happened was that uh, like the young population were more interested in like say electronic dance music which is like for like uh, the bpm uh, where is, is actually like important there um, so when they actually like looked at users wave uh, people who listen to electronic dance music and non edm users they actually saw a totally like a different result so uh, the re reason why this uh, happens is that uh, because the in your current population you had more young people, but uh, what you want to target was the actual population like after a few uh, say months or so when you are when you are actually growing right. So you so uh, that is the population you want to target. So the solution here is to actually like uh, weigh the uh, confidence intervals. The solution uh, I think you can go through this link. 
uh, which explains uh, the solution that they have adopted. So this is again like another pitfall. Uh, whether whether you are, whatever that current base you are actually uh, having is actually whether it's actually like reflecting of your target population. Okay. Yeah. So that is uh, it from my end. Um, so I I actually I'm also like learning uh, these concepts. Uh, I struggle with these concepts myself. Uh, I I have like listed some of the books that I actually like when I'm sharing this with you guys. Um, so you can also check it out. Uh, some of the authors of this book uh, say for this book uh, uh, they also are on LinkedIn and they share good stuff. You can also follow those. Um, yeah, so that's it uh, from me. Uh, like I would request uh, a session feedback and also uh, please connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, yeah. So yeah, uh, sir. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, I'm the co-moderator. So I just want to ask you like uh, will you be able to upload this file on your GitHub page? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will upload. I will also share it, share it here. Yeah. Okay, cool. That's good. Cool. And uh, second thing, like we have some of the questions, so uh, like seven or eight. So you want me to read that out, or uh, like it is possible to you to answer them? Uh, we have some time. Okay. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I I can like make a note of this, and I can also like uh, respond to that in the page. Okay, let me also make a note of this. Okay, so I'll just uh, answer uh, one or two questions. And yeah, so uh, the first question is, can you please explain with some example, what is a confounding variable? Okay, so uh, confounding variable is basically like a, um, like, like a variable that is that you are not like uh, thought about, uh, say, for example, the in the example that we actually like saw, uh, you will have like, um, uh, so you are, you are looking at say the agricultural yield. So the and you, you what the variable that you know and you are interested in is only like say the nitrogen fertilizer. But what happens is that there are also like other variables that you that is actually like uh, impact the agricultural yield. Uh, like which which uh, some of them you can guess like say soil fertility or weather. But there are also like other things like say uh, so sometimes in the, in the time duration, right? Uh, like say in some seasons there might be pests. Uh, and that that can affect the agricultural yield, right? So, uh, so th those are uh, so those are the variables, like say which you you are not aware of, uh, but those can also have an effect on uh, have an uh, effect on your inference that you are making. So those variables are called as uh, confounding variables. So in our case, like say the soil fertility and uh, so those things were say the rain uh, for that season. So those are confounding variables. Um, so, which be, because we in our uh, in the experiment that we are looking at, we are only looking at nitrogen fertilizer. All these extraneous variables are called confounding variables. Okay. Uh, there is a question about say A/B testing is predominantly used in manufacturing industry. Can you please comment on this? How can this be used in data science projects? So I I'm not from the manufacturing industry background, so I I'm uh, I, I, have, I don't know uh, like exactly like which use cases are uh, they are targeting, but uh, any kind of design, right? Say not just uh, say not not any kind of say this is actually a generic skill. Data science itself is a generic skill, but this is also the A/B testing is also like a, a generic skill that can up, get applied across industries. Uh, so, and it's also like a say basic research methodology, like a B testing is kind of like randomized control trial, uh, which is a research methodology that you have. And uh, like, so uh, you, you can like say, whenever you want to like say, come up with, uh, say you have a hypothesis and you want to test it out, you can think about like, say how you can uh, like segregate groups on, on what basis, on what randomization unit you will pick. Uh, to segregate groups and how you will run the test and how long you will run the test. So th th those things you can like um, uh, think through uh, like whichever uh, problem, whichever industry problem that's there, you can do it. Okay, please. Okay, let's say PIM asks you to conduct a test and wants to results fast, let's say two weeks. However, you know for the experiment to be successful, you need more time. Is there any approach you can take? Yeah, so the, there are uh, there are specifically like some um, so there are specifically some techniques that actually like uh, uh, that people use so that they get around these problems. Uh, so there are there are a lot of techniques. So uh, there are a lot of problems that comes with the A/B testing, like heterogeneous treatment effect and the sample size becoming like uh, you needing a lot. 
Um, so those kinds of uh, things for each of them, there are other techniques like there is one technique called Cupid. Um, so those, so the, there are other techniques that you can adopt to uh, like run the test faster. Um, uh, in in addition to that, you can also like say use multi arm bandits uh, if you don't want to like say if you want to com if you can compromise on the say the the truth of the your uh, hypothesis but you just want to profit from say if you want to like say which one is doing better you just want to quickly do you can also run um, multi arm bandits those kinds of things you can run please show slide again and re explain in brief okay okay so so this slide uh, um so the uh, so I can like uh, there are there are some stuff I will I'll share the uh, document where I picked this particular diagram from so um, I'll, I'll share it with you guys so it is basically like when you have like say in your conference interval say within say between five percent and sound sound point five percent and if you want if your minimum detection effect is three percent right so uh, like say the, for example I'll just say for uh, one right here. Uh, so you are here. Your uh, your confidence interval is lying between say five and seven point five, but your minimum detection effect is at three percent. So it is like in these cases you can like go ahead that you have achieved both statistical and practical significance, and then you can launch. So like this, you you have like for each of that you you have some kind of like decision steps that you have to take. Uh, I will share you what this document. This is this is also available in this pair in this book if you want to refer. There is one document also that is actually like explains this step by step. I can I will share it with you like offline. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think I will stop here. Uh, rest of the questions I will I will respond to you like within a week in the data hour page right. Uh, so there is a discussion thing. Uh, the, mm -hmm. Within a week I will put those answers in that page. Okay, I have the questions. I'll respond there. Okay. Thanks everybody. Thanks for joining. Okay.